It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christian Weedbrook from Xanadu, right? He is the CEO and founder of Xanadu Quantum Technologies. It is a Canadian quantum technology company that is building fault-tolerant quantum computers. That sounds hard to do. Uh, using light. That sounds even harder to do. Okay, over the past 15 years, he has been at the forefront of bringing quantum technology to the world through his research and leadership in academia, government, and industry. Please help me to welcome Dr. Christian Weedbrook. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today and looking forward to telling you more about uh, Xanadu and our journey so far. So Xanadu's mission, uh, we always like to start off with our mission, and it gives us the guiding light of what we're trying to do, is to build quantum computers that are useful and available to people everywhere. We were founded seven years ago. Actually, we had our seventh year anniversary uh, last week, I think it was. And we have over 180 people, and probably get up to about 200 by the end of the year, and based in downtown Toronto. So we're a full stack uh, company like others. Um, we do everything from the hardware all the way up to the algorithms and software side of things. Um, so we design the chips, our integrated photonic chips uh, in Toronto. Uh, we're kind of like a fabulous company. So think of NVIDIA where we actually design the chips in-house and send them off to different foundries around the world. Uh, we've done a number of uh, QPU, uh, our chip uh, generations. Uh, we get them back from the foundries after a certain amount of time and then we uh, package them in-house and put it all together to build a quantum computer. We have our cloud platform called Xanadu Cloud. Uh, people can access our quantum computers. And we also have our software stack, uh, which is known as Penny Lane. We also have a team working on the application side of things as well. And we've had a number of uh, very good publications, uh, which I'll talk more about. So uh, we've heard a lot from the conference uh, yesterday and today about how, um, how many different types of people it required to actually build a quantum computer. So if we break it up into the hardware, software, and application side of things, you can see the different and variety types of uh, companies that we work with. So from the hardware side, we work with a number of foundries around the world, as I mentioned, uh, also some cryostat companies. Uh, in a moment, I'll talk how we only have a small number of cooling systems required for our computer. And also, we've been working with NIST for many years now, and a great partner for us. Uh, from the software side, with our Penny Lane architecture, uh, we work with, uh, you know, from all the small quantum startups all the way up to the big, large companies like AWS, Google, and IBM, and NVIDIA. And from the application side, uh, initially we focused on uh, finance in the early days, uh, but now for the last three or four years, we've been focusing on quantum chemistry, uh, material design, and more specifically, next generation battery development. Originally from, uh, from the hardware side of things, uh, we, we did have the world's first and still have the world's first commercially available photonic cloud uh, that allows you to access our, our photonic quantum computers. We started off with nine qubits uh, or light fields uh, that we use. And then last year, the team demonstrated quantum supremacy. Uh, it was published in Nature. It was only the third time ever uh, this was achieved, first time famously by Google and then by a Chinese team, and then the first time by a private company uh, by us in Toronto. And that used 216 qubits, and we named the, uh, the computer Borealis. This is always a fun slide to, to show everyone. Um, so what you do in quantum computational advantage or quantum supremacy is you choose a very well-defined problem and then you go head to head essentially, a classical supercomputer versus uh, our Borealis machine. Uh, we're always careful to note it's an it's, it's a esoteric math problem, it's not a business problem, but for us it's an important stepping stone towards fault tolerance. So here's some of the stats. If we had used all of 7.6 million cause of the world's fastest uh, supercomputer, which is in Japan, it would have taken 7 million years to solve this problem, and then the corresponding energy uh, along with that. For our Borealis machine, we solved the same problem that would have taken 7 million years in two minutes. And then you can see the orders of magnitude of uh, potential energy savings as well. So this was a very big achievement. And uh, not only an achievement sort of that we feel you have to pass through to get to fault tolerance, but a lot of the hardware that was developed for this demonstration uh, is actually needed for fault tolerance as well. 
So why would we want to use uh, uh, photonics? Um, well, there's a number of benefits. So from the computational side of things, there's no cooling required. So we're quite specific about our word choice sets. For the computing side, uh, we do need some cryostats at the start to prepare our qubits. Um, but after the qubits are being prepared, everything is at actually at room temperature, which is important. So um, we don't have to worry about how you get more and more wires down a cryostat. We don't have to worry about putting FPGAs for decoding into the cryostat or things like that. So a lot of people get excited about that. And the real reason to get excited is the ability to iterate fast. So it is a, a kind of a race uh, to a million qubits. I think there'll be a few winners. Hopefully Xanadu is one of them. Um, but it's about the iteration process. Uh, it takes time to cool down these systems and heat them back up. And we can just do it in a matter of minutes. Uh, also, the manufacturability. Uh, at the moment, it's less of an issue. Um, you know, if you want to mass produce quantum chips, whatever your approach is, you don't, uh, you know, we don't need to use very high vol volume fabs or tier one fabs. Although we do work with Global Foundries, which is one of those fabs. But for the most part, uh, like everyone else in the industry, we work with sort of small and medium sized R&D uh, uh, foundries. Um, but let's assume where a lot of us are successful and we want to mass produce. Photonics is the only approach that allows you to um, take your chip designs to these foundries and they already have the tools to actually fabricate them. Um, so that's a very important uh, benefit. Error correction flexibility. Essentially, we don't have to choose or locked, uh, be locked into the type of error correction model or code uh, at the start. We have a lot of flexibility there. Compatible telecom. We didn't have to invent a laser or we didn't have to invent fiber optics, uh, which saves us a lot of time and money. Faster clock speeds, um, that comes from the teleco, uh, teleco uh, industry as well, and also the modular and network ability. It's extremely unlikely that any approach will, will uh, you know, in order to get to a million qubits, will have a million qubits on a single chip, and you'll have a modular approach. So think of maybe like a data center, a small data center that takes up about an acre, half an acre of land, half a football field, um, and uh, you have, say, hundreds or thousands of server racks in there, and each server rack has a small quantum computer in it, and you scale up by networking all the uh, modules or server racks together. So our thesis is, what better way to do that than if you're already using a light-based approach and you're just distributing um, logical qubits via the, the fault tolerance, uh, via the, the optical components, the fiber optics. So that's a huge, uh, huge benefit for photonic-based approaches. So what does our high-level roadmap look like for fault tolerance? Well, the initial stage is really having the optical components um, you know, really mastering them. And then once you've done that, you start building a module or a server rack um, that actually has a low loss component. You know, that we just talked about the benefits, but we like to be uh, as balanced as possible. The biggest challenge that, that you know, could uh, destroy us is our inability to overcome loss. So loss is the biggest challenge by far for us and other photonic-based approaches. Fault tolerance and error correction allows you to deal with it. So does uh, better designs and working with um, foundries uh, as well and, and, and other approaches. So after we've got a single module that has a small number of fault tolerant quantum computers, uh, it's essentially then um, mass producing, you know, having hundreds or thousands of these single modules or server racks. And then as mentioned before, connecting together to have a small uh, quantum data center. That's the hardware side of things. Uh, also like to talk about, um, you know, Xanadu is full stack, so we also work on the software. Our software is uh, called Penny Lane. Uh, there's a few different stats there. I like the first one where it says uh, it's available, it's, uh, it's available on many different hardwares. That's what we like about it and our users love about it, is you can just download Penny Lane or log into our website and use it and then access through different plugins most of the other hardware players out there. And so a lot of customers like to do benchmarking and playing around, see which one does a certain algorithm best based on their noise models and so forth. Uh, we also have a every February a, a, a QHack. It's a Penny Lane developer conference. And uh, we've had over 8,000 people attend. Uh, it's only growing every year. So everyone's welcome to, to join if you'd like. The other aspect that we re really like about Penny Lane it's available, uh, it's used in a number of um, universities around the world. So, so far it's 50 and counting. And essentially where quantum computing uh, or quantum mechanics with application courses are taught, uh, there's usually one or two lectures on the programming side of things as well. And uh, Penny Lane is used as part of the curriculum. And we also have a textbook called Codebook that uh, professors like to, to use as well. 
So in terms of Penny Lane, uh, you know, because no one has a million qubits yet, it's all about building the ecosystem, which is from our side what Penny Lane does as well. It's also about the ed educational side uh, and the training side. Um, if and when quantum computers become powerful enough to, to start solving important business problems, you gonna wanna uh, have a workforce that can actually operate these computers. And that's uh, one of the jobs of Penny Lane. And you can see all the different uh, future workforce that we're building in different parts of the world, uh, Europe, North America, two big areas. Uh, so is uh, Asia and also the rest of the world. So in terms of our partnering with other um, organizations, um, there's uh, a few different ways to do that. Uh, we believe we have one of the world's best uh, teams in quantum machine learning, so we have a QML research program that customers like to work with us on. Uh, we also, as mentioned, we focus on next generation batteries. That's one of our, uh, our main focus when it comes to algorithms, and we have an algorithm team dedicated just to that. And then finally, um, the software development for Penny Lane as well. That kind of feeds back into the QML and uh, quantum chemistry side as well. Uh, often a lot of the, the um, proposals that we work on with companies are about adding to the toolbox of Penny Lane uh, as well. So the industry use cases, on the top row is the applications that we focus on, and then on the bottom is Penny Lane, where it's open source so people can do whatever they want and add to it as well. As mentioned, we start off with finance uh, in the early days. We, we don't believe, at least this decade, that there's any quantum advantage or applications, um, even for a fault-tolerant quantum computer with a million qubits. Uh, we hope we're, we're wrong, and there can always be uh, advancements with the algorithm side of things. Uh, but because of that, we've focused in the last three years on uh, uh, molecular simulations and next generation battery development. We've worked with a number of the top tier uh, automobile companies. You can see some of them listed there, BMW, Volkswagen, and also uh, Rolls-Royce. And as mentioned on the bottom row, uh, Penny Lane is open source, so people can kind of do whatever they want or ask us to work with them on certain things. So uh, DARPA was a good project when it came to um, Penny Lane development in terms of QML, and then we also work with AWS, who uh, their bracket service has Penny Lane pre-installed on it, and also NVIDIA. NVIDIA is getting into the game in terms of the simulation side of things. Uh, classical computing uh, has, you know, needs to be thought of as a very important part of building a quantum computer, particularly when you're looking at coming up with the best codes, error correction codes, and so forth. You have to do a lot of simulation, which gets quite intractable very quickly. So. Uh, Penny Lane works with uh, NVIDIA's uh, QQuantum uh, software, and also we've worked with a number of supercompute uh, facilities, uh, particularly in America. So I'll just end on this slide, uh, the battery research. You know, to be honest, um, we've chosen a topic, as, as others have as well. It's still unclear exactly where a quantum computer can help with battery uh, research. Uh, it doesn't stop us from working on that with some of our valued uh, partners. But we always have the, the thought experiment. Let's assume we have a million qubits today. You know, it has 100 or 1,000 logical qubits. What would we do with it? Well, it's not like just getting the latest version of a GPU chip or Intel chip and swapping in the old one, putting in a new one. That's we just know is going to be faster at the usual stuff. You really have to work with partners to understand where the classical bottlenecks are in terms of classical simulation. And sometimes even part of that's a quantum computer can't help, but then you, you partition and find parts where a quantum computer can help. Even then you've got to look at what's driving the slowness and look at the mathematics and so forth. And then you've got to apply or connect the mathematics of that to the mathematics of quantum physics. So it takes a long time. So in a sense, a million qubits is still a few years away, but in one sense it's good because uh, we still need a lot of work on the algorithm development. Um, so given all that, uh, we still work with Volkswagen and a lot of others. Um, it's good for joint patents and publications. They also internally need to promote this work as well and, and get their management on board. So it's a win-win situation. Uh, typically in this case here, we, we looked at a subset of the overall battery system, which is a very complicated system uh, anyways. And uh, we use quantum phase estimation and so forth. And uh, um, you know, one of the key things is how do you help the hardware? So in this case, so the team reduced the qubit required qubit count by two, and also the gate count was reduced by 10 to the four, so 10,000. And that also helps the hardware because if you sort of say for certain algorithms you need less uh, depth or, or less qubits, then that also is another way along with the hardware improvements uh, as well. So a lot of work that's been done at Xanadu, and just to reiterate, we're full stack, uh, we do the hardware, we do the software, we do the algorithms, and we're, 
really defined by our hardware and our photonic-based approach. So I'll leave it there, and thank you, everyone. Have time for questions? Does anybody have a question for Christian? Any questions? Uh, we have one here. Oh, yes. Yeah, fundamentally hardware. Um, you know, hopefully one day you talk less about the hardware and it's all about the software, which is where we all want to head. But uh, fundamentally, we're a hardware company and we're getting ready uh, with other parts of the company. But, uh, you know, time and money and our focus is all about the hardware. Uh, yeah. um, in the platonic system, are you able to uh, entangle any two qubits together or, or do you have limitations? No, in, in principle, we have the all to all connectivity. And that's because um, we have, you know, often you think about a two-dimensional uh, plane where the qubits lay. Uh, we can uh, we, we leverage the two dimensions of, of space, but we can also leverage time as well. So you have the, the 2D plane propagating through time, which effectively gives you a three-dimensional cube. And we did a, uh, that was part of our quantum supremacy experiment as well. Um, so what that means is you can kind of plug in and delay certain nodes. We use a cluster state method and then connect any other qubit that you want based on the algorithm you want and more importantly, based on the error correction and fault tolerant codes you use. So that's a real benefit, the ability for our codes not to require local connections, but non-local connections. Is there one last uh, question? Maybe? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? All right. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone.